That works. So this is yeah. forward, I take it? All right. And then I think it says on. It's on? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Right now. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. It's good to have you here. Risking the weather. It's starting to snow already. But uh, um, yeah, wonderful to have you here. This is a second in our series of the uh, Restoration and Management Seminar at Tallgrass Prairie Center. And so um, if you haven't been here before, welcome. I see some of my students here. And thanks for coming. And you'll get extra credit, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, uh, if you didn't get an announcement by email and you would like to, uh, we do have a sign-up sheet here and uh, Stacy can get you on our mailing list. So, um, yeah. Let's see. What else do I need to say? Um, uh, I guess what I want to say is that I'm really excited to uh, introduce you to my student, my former student, <laughs> Amy Carlin Husfeth and her husband, Jason Husfeth. And um, I, I sent out an email earlier today to some of the faculty and others to remind them to come to this. And I, I wanted to title it, instead of, of Amy's very fine and competent <laughs> title, I wanted to call it Buried Treasure and Romance. And so that's the, that's the subtext that you'll, you'll learn more about. Um, uh, so Amy uh, is an Iowa girl. She uh, grew up in Decorah and on a, on a farm. And she came to UNI. And I think I took your, you took my applied ecology class mm -hmm. in like 2003 or Two, something. Two, I think. 2002. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, she was a baby-faced sophomore at the time. And uh, then she decided to do her master's here mm -hmm. at UNI and um, did some research on forb enhancement of prairie grass stands. So we spent a lot of time on our hands and knees mm -hmm. counting seedlings, <laughs> which is kind of, kind of our thing. Yes. And... Uh, and there were several undergrads associated with that project as well. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I also want to recognize Craig Hemsath here, who, was her, <laughs> who came after her as a grad student and continued on with some of that research. So, um, so that was fun. Anyway, uh, Amy uh, finished her master's, went up to Minnesota, and got a couple of different jobs as an in environmental consulting mm -hmm. and uh, kind of, you know, just left a path of, of, of accomplishments in, <laughs> in her wake and uh, um, uh, eventually ended up with uh, Mr. Husbeth here and a wonderful project that you'll learn more about mm -hmm. uh, this afternoon. And one of the reasons that this is so cool is that it is a combination of uh, of uh, conservation of rare and endangered species, and it's also a story of a business, a, a small business, a very uh, successful small business that, that mm -hmm. makes good things happen in nature. So um, I'm probably forgetting something obvious that I should be saying, but I'll turn it over to you. Anyway. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's nice to be back home. It feels really nice here. So I'm, I'm happy to present our work to you. So I'm going to be talking today about how we develop wetland mitigation credits in Minnesota through the restoration of what we call exceptional natural resources. So looking forward to sharing this story with you. Um, just to start out though, why do we have wetland mitigation banking in Minnesota? And in order to understand that, you have to get a feel for the fact that Minnesota is a unique state and we have a special law called the Wetland Conservation Act. And when I first moved to Minnesota, everybody called the Wetland Conservation Act the WACA. And I had no idea what anyone was talking about. They just kept referring to WACA and I had to Google it and figure it out. But it turns out what this is is a unique state law only in Minnesota established in 1991 with the goal of protecting all wetlands in the state. So no matter how large or small or important or unimportant they seemed, they were all protected by this state law. And the basic rule says that any wetland in the state must not be drained, filled, or excavated unless replaced by restoring or creating wetlands of at least equal public value under an approved replacement plan. So it's pretty stringent. And what are the overarching goals of this law? The goal is to achieve what they call no net loss in the quantity, quality, and biological diversity of Minnesota's existing wetlands. 
So it's not just acreage, it's also the quality and the, and, um, the biological diversity. So the other goals are to increase the, to actually increase the quantity, quality, and biological diversity of the wetlands through restoration of degraded or drained wetlands or through the creation of new wetlands. So we're trying to actually add to the number of wetlands in the state or replace what was lost before this law was enacted. And also to avoid direct or indirect impacts to wetlands resulting from human activities and to replace wetland values lost when a project cannot feasibly avoid impacting a wetland resource through certain mitigation measures. So it's pretty stringent. So what counts for wetland, or what is wetland mitigation? And it is a method for replacing wetland values, including quantity and quality, when impacts to wetland resources just cannot be avoided, which as you know happens when you have a housing development project going in or a road project, sometimes wetlands have to be impacted in order to bring this infrastructure in. And in Minnesota, if you impact an area of wetland, mitigation is typically required at two to one. For, so basically every acre or every square foot of wetland that you impact, you have to mitigate with two acres. So you don't just get to take one acre, you have to give two back. So you're actually adding wetlands if you have to impact them. And mitigation can be achieved through on-site mitigation efforts or through the purchase of previously banked wetland credits from an approved wetland banking site. So for instance, at this proposed housing development, if a wetland impact were to need to occur, which it will or it is going to be happening, the developer would have the option of trying to create new wetlands somewhere in the edges of the site or adjacent to a different area or they would have the option of purchasing the credits elsewhere at a different site from a wetland area that was already restored for that purpose and I'll explain that a little more. So what's the difference between on-site wetland mitigation and buying from a mitigation bank? Well on-site uh, wetland mitigation like I said would require restoring a wetland within the same project area as the impact occurred. And it requires that the developer, whoever was creating that impact, would need to complete the restoration activities themselves or with consultants. And they would also need to complete at least five years of monitoring of that site to make sure that they met the requirements. And often what we find is that when developers or other projects do this, you'll end up with restored wetlands that are small, and low in quality and usually fragmented from a more natural system. And they often are left unmanaged once the permits are in place, everyone goes about their business and they get forgotten. And that potential for failure of that area um, is much higher. And also we know that the endeavor can be risky for developers because they don't know how much it's going to cost to restore a wetland on their site. They don't know if it'll be successful and meet the requirements of their permit. And there's just something, you know, they're not wetland scientists, they're doing something else. So it's a bit risky for them. And it may mean that they lose developable land within a piece of property that they own and they want to put in as many houses as they can. So they don't necessarily want to give up a space for wetland restoration. So there's just some things that happen with on-site mitigation. Now, wetland mitigation banking, so what is a mitigation bank? It is a designated area of wetland or other aquatic resource that has been previously restored or previously created or restored for the, just for the purpose of providing banked wetland credits to be used when an unavoidable impact occurs. So it's like there, it's a restored wetland that was already created and it's just sitting there ready for somebody to buy those credits so that they don't have to do on-site wetland mitigation themselves. And wetland mitigation banks are usually larger in size compared to something on site. They're usually higher in quality and often less fragmented because they were created just for the purpose of being wetland, not an afterthought. And they always require a long-term management plan. Um, they can be purchased by developers. It's much of a lower risk thing because it's a set cost for them. It's a one-time cost and it's at a price that they agree to with the person that owns the wetland bank. So it's an open market. And it can help with the long-term planning processes for uh, some of our clients like cities and counties that have 
long-term plans, say for a five-year road project, they'll know in advance they'll be impacting X number of acres of wetland and where can I find my replacement credits way ahead of time and take care of that. So it just provides some opportunity. So who can create a wetland mitigation bank in Minnesota? A mitigation bank can be really created by anybody, a government agency, a corporation, a nonprofit organization, or other entity, if they're just willing to go through this long establishment process. And wetland banking credits can be developed for use by the owner of the bank. For instance, we have a, a client, a county, who's interested in creating their own bank so that they don't have to go out and find credits and buy them from someone else. They'll create their own, and when they impact wetlands on a road project, well, we already have our own credits to use. And, or it can be done as an entrepreneurial venture with the intent to sell credits for profit to others needing mitigation for unavoidable impacts. So you can just be a, a wetland bank developer as a, a business up in Minnesota. It's an opportunity. So how do you create a wetland mitigation bank in Minnesota? Just in general, it's a lengthy three-part application process. It can take a couple of years sometimes to get one of these projects approved and go through all the agency review. And once you get that started, you complete a legal survey of your site boundary. You record a perpetual conservation easement over the entire site, which you convey to the state of Minnesota. So they are permanently protected areas. And then you construct or implement your approved project. And you're allowed to use certain, what they call actions eligible for the creation of wetland credits which I'll explain a little bit more about that. And then you complete monitoring and you demonstrate that you have met the, the performance standards that were set up for you back when you're in the application process. And once you've done that, you can deposit your wetland credits into a public account that's managed by the state of Minnesota. And they, they run a big database online so you can see where in the state are credits available, how much about are they going for, who owns the bank, who do I contact. So there's this whole market going on up there. And once you've deposited your credits, you can start selling them at, like I said, a price you negotiate with the person buying from you. And it can be a really profitable endeavor for some folks. For instance, in the metro area, one uh, acre, or, sorry, credits are selling for about $1.25 per square foot up to $2.25 per square foot, which as you can see really starts to add up when you're talking about acres of impact. So you can be selling one acre of your restored wetland for $55,000 to $100,000 for an acre, so it's profitable. And then once you have all that going, you just continue to monitor your site for at least five years, but you are responsible for maintaining it in perpetuity, so forever, because they are under a conservation easement. So those actions eligible for credit that I mentioned, how do you create a wetland bank? Um, what are the different ways that you can do it? Well, in Minnesota, there's a couple of ways that are really common. One of them is to create a new wetland, and that's just by basically excavating an upland area and creating a new wetland where there wasn't formerly a wetland. And another opportunity is to like, use hydrologic restoration of a previously drained area, so like a tiled crop field or an area that was ditched. There's an opportunity to kind of reflood those areas and replant it with native vegetation so that um, you're essentially restoring an old drained wetland area. And so we would say that most banks are developed using what we call sort of engineering type projects where Jason always says water flows downhill, so if you dig a hole, it'll probably fill with water and then you'll start getting a wetland type area coming back. And so what we find is that this achieves that Wetland Conservation Act goal of no net loss of quantity of wetlands, but not necessarily that goal of preserving biodiversity. So you often get a planting area that maybe has seven or nine native species in there and with the engineered type projects or a flooded area. And it does meet the intent of the law, but it's not necessarily the nicest wetland restoration that you'll see. So, but like we said, it's a fairly straightforward process. It's an engineering type process. It doesn't include high level vegetation standards. And typically if you do a wetland project like this, you'll, um, for every one acre of wetland that you restore or create, you'll have one acre to sell. So it's, 
it's a, kind of the more popular way to create wetland banks. So what, what about other ways? Are there additional ways? What is another action eligible for credit? And there's one other method that exists in the Wetland Conservation Act law. And we say it's kind of in the back room. It's all dusty. No one really uses it very often because it's tricky. And what it is is to, it's called restoration and protection of a wetland with exceptional natural resource value. It's what they call ENRV. So if I say ENRV from here on out, I'm talking about this. And I'll, I'll probably say that because it's just something that I'm used to saying now. Um, and like I said, it's rarely applied due to the, well, the rarity of the sites that even qualify for this type of project, um, the high level of information required to qualify a site for it, and the intensity of vegetation restoration involved in developing this type of project. And as far as Jason and I know, there are fewer than six ENRV type banks in the state of Minnesota, and I think we're involved with all of them so far today. Our company serves as the consultant to help get these going. So like I said, it includes very high vegetation performance standards. That's really the goal of this type of project. And it really requires a high level of botanical expertise. You have to know what you're looking at, what kind of site would qualify for this, and then how to restore it. So it's a higher risk than those engineering type projects that we talked about because you're working with vegetation restoration only. And you know how tricky that can be. And sometimes you fail, and sometimes it doesn't go as you planned, and you have to adapt along the way. So it's not as easy as excavating upland and, and lining it and getting water to settle there. It's a different type of project. And also, credit is usually up to 50%. So you're getting a half an acre of credit for every one acre that you restore. So it's a little. Um, less than if you did a one-to-one -one type project. So what's unique about this ENRV provision? Well, it's an opportunity to create wetland credits for sale just through vegetation restoration alone. So we're not doing hydrologic restoration, we're not plugging ditches or uh, breaking tile line, uh, we're just restoring vegetation. So it, it's an opportunity to do this type of project in an area where there might not be space to flood an old wetland area because you have homes all around it and it's already developed, but you might have a nice wetland in the center of that site that needs restoration. And it also, it puts dedicated funding towards the restoration and permanent protection of unique wetland habitats in Minnesota. And it provides a financial incentive or reward to the landowner that has that area to actually restore and protect it. So it might actually, they might make money to restore an area, which is really unheard of as far as I know. And it does achieve that goal of the Wetland Conservation Act to get no net loss of wetland quality and biodiversity. So it's not adding quantity as an acreage, but we're getting quantity or quality and biodiversity. And there's plenty of other banks that are working on acres and quantity. So, so like I said, it's rare for a site to qualify for this action eligible for credit. So sites with the potential to become ENRV wetland mitigation banks must really be the best of the best as far as quality. So Jason and I were talking about, you know, in Iowa, it might be a part of Hayden Prairie, like just one of those nice areas that are main, they're just remaining in the state or like Dominic Prairie where we used to go visit, just a lot of nice, unique biodiversity, but needing some restoration. And um, so what types of wetland resources can be developed into these ENRV banks? Well, they need to contain exceptional natural resources. So they usually have threatened and endangered species or something would be a rare plant community as designated by the Minnesota DNR. They have a list of plant communities that are considered rare. Um, they, need to, they could contain sensitive surface waters. So restoring a trout stream and its repairing areas sometimes would qualify for this and or some other type of special habitat. They need to be difficult to replace. So, you know, if you lose a peatland, it's not easy to recreate that type of system. It's pretty much gone once it's, it's gone. It should be unique in the context of its location. So for instance, I put up this picture of one of these potential sites. There's a tamarack swamp back here. 
And this is Gander Mountain in a storage facility in I-35, but that Tamarack Swamp is like the southernmost Tamarack Swamp in the state. And it has some unique species in there, so it's one of those sites we would, it's, it's rare in its context of location, and it has a threatened, or a rare plant community in there. Um, it has to be connected to other open space. So for instance, this one right here, here's our wetland area that we might look at. And then here's, this is all county land back there. So it's already adjacent to protected land. Um, and also the site could maybe eventually, it should at least be able to qualify for a DNA, DNR SNA site, which is the highest designation of public land in the state. So it has to be so nice as, as far as quality is con concerned. If it's a really high quality site, it could qualify as a DNR SNA site someday in the future. So it should have those types of characteristics. And it needs to be under pressure or threat of some type. So for instance, development adjacent to it, and it needs to have restoration potential. So it, it needs to have some areas that are degraded and then some pockets of nice remnant vegetation. So you know you could expand that area with some nice restoration efforts. And it's up to the applicant wanting to create this type of bank to provide the information that qualifies the site to the agency. So there's a lot of upfront work that goes into creating this type of bank. So how do you find the right site for this type of project? And this is what our company specializes in. Um, we specialize in that development of these types of banks. And the first step, like I said, is site identification and selection. So we have primarily located our, our ENRV type banking sites within an area of the state called the Anoka Sand Plain Ecological Subsection. And that's the area shown here in yellow. The pink counties are the 11 county metro area. So they're the really developed areas in Minnesota. So you can see that that ecological sub, that yellow area is really under threat by development. And it's about 1.1 million acres in size. It was formed beneath a large glacial lake system about 16,000 to 13,000 years ago. This is a little uh, subset you can maybe see. Like this is Washington County right here. And then this was all an old glacial lake system. So the area is really flat and it's gently rolling and it contains a lot of uh, well-drained sandy uplands with scattered pockets of of peatlands, like little peat depressions that were formed in these old ice block depressions. And um, so they're kind of scattered throughout the area. I'll show you how that looks. So if we look at a couple of maps of this area, so again, this is the Anoka Sand Plain. And over here uh, on this side, we have the surficial geology. So this area shown in light blue are the uh, lacustrine sands that just kind of settled out of that lake system. And then these bright pink areas are the peat dep the depressions left by ice blocks that are now filled in with peat. So there's these nice little peatland systems scattered throughout this area of all sandy lake deposits. And then if you look at the pre-settlement map, which is what I have over here, we lit up the pink areas again. And those were mapped uh, previously, like in 1850, as wet prairie areas. So this is where we're, we're kind of we're focusing in these areas that are pink for looking for these special sites that would qualify for the ENRV program. And just, I also put up a map of threatened and endangered species that are located within the Anoka Sand Plain area, which is again outlined in yellow. And all those red dots are threatened and endangered species. So you can see it's quite a hotbed for these types of things. And we know there are at least 52 vascular plant species that are listed um, in that area. And 18 of them occur just in those little uh, wet meadow areas, the little pink areas that I showed you. So it's very full of rare species. So just looking at the, the sites that we are checking out for potential to qualify for these bank sites, like I said, this area is this modeled landscape of wetland complexes with little upland islands scattered throughout. So you have these areas of deep peat, and then they create, there's a transition. So it goes from deep peat, a transition zone, up to uh, these upland islands that are dry and sandy. So this is kind of the typical landscape that we're looking at. It's uh, gently undulating, 
with, like I said, these broad ecotones, and that's a lot of times where we'll find a lot of plant diversity is in those transition zones between deep wetland areas and upland islands. Um, there's a lot of surface water and shallow groundwater interaction occurring because of the sandy soils. You'll get rain falling into the upland areas. It, it infiltrates, hits a confining layer, and then runs over into the wetland system. So there's a lot of this water movement going on too, just under the surface of the, of the, the surface. And um, let's see, so what else do I want to say? So we also, when we find these areas, we see this repeated and just this unique assemblage of species. So a lot of associated species that we often find in these wetland systems that seem to occur over and over again. So it's typical to see the same types of plant communities in these areas. And some of the high quality remnants that we have encountered have retained about 150 native species or more. So they're very diverse. And what we've also found is that even though they've often become overrun by non-native species like reed canary grass, they often have a viable dormant native seed bank lying underneath those heavy thickets of reed canary grass or buckthorn that's just waiting to be exposed to sun and light so that it can actually grow again. And we also know that there are a variety of rare vascular plant species, um, and they're especially rare because they're on the very western edge of their range. And historically, we know that these areas were open and herbaceous, but today they are often invaded by woody species like buckthorn and green ash is really common out there, and aspen just start to take over in these areas, where historically fire would have kept them more open and more herbaceous. So they're pretty neat. And this is going to show you a few of the species that we see out there that are rare or endangered in the state. And this is tubercle rain orchid, a Minnesota threatened species is common in these wetland systems. The landsleaf violet, which is also a threatened species, which is, we actually see this fairly commonly when we're encountering these types of wetland systems. There's Scalaria triglomerata, a tall nutrush, also endangered. The crossleaf milkwort, again, an endangered species. And I should note that a lot of these are about this tall. So I still get down and look for things in the grass just like I was doing it when I did my research here. This is Rotaloramosaur, again, a threatened species. Clinton's bulrush, also threatened. That's also a very small one. And then the twisted yellow-eyed grass, again, a Minnesota endangered species. And then there's also a variety of the rubus species that occur in these wetland systems. There are nine rubus species in the state that are listed as endangered or threatened. And I think there's 40 species total in the state. So, and a lot of the rare ones occur in these wetland systems that we're looking at. And they always grow on top of each other. All these different species are melded into one and you have to really pick them apart and try to find out which one's which, and is it rare or isn't it? Because without looking really closely, you wouldn't know. So, again, with site selection, uh, our site identification and selection, not all wet meadows, obviously, within the Anoka Sand Plain area can or should qualify for development into a wetland mitigation bank under those banking provisions. Um, there's still other site characteristics that we look at. We look at the existing soil types. We found that there's often if we see Zimmerman's, Isanti, Markey, and Rifle type soils uh, in the same type of area, they can often support these viable native seed banks. Um, we look at the hydrology of a site. It has to be at least somewhat intact because the seed bank needs to have, say, saturated in order to still be viable. We look at the microtopography of the site. So um, if it has that nice transition from a, maybe a deeper peat up into an upland area, often we know it has the potential to be restored to a more diverse area. And we look for pockets of high quality remnants still remaining in a larger area. And we look for any rare species or any historic records of a rare species that might have occurred there in the past. And 
Um, we also look for more common species that we know would occur with rare species. So if they're there, we know to look a little bit harder for something else. And we look actually at restoration potential. So we'll look along things like deer paths or ATV trails, somewhere where there's disturbance so that light can get down to the soil. And oftentimes that's where we'll, we'll find something that's unique and rare and it tells us, oh, maybe there's an opportunity here to do some restoration. So I put up this picture of, um, you can see all the little white flowers in there and that's all lance leaf violet, the threatened species. And it's in there amongst reed canary grass and it's along an old ditch system and if you didn't look hard at the right time of year, you might not even know that it was in there and that there was a chance to restore that area to something really nice. So again, we also look a little bit further at restoration potential and one of the ways we did this or do it, and we don't do it as often anymore because we've had so much success in what we do, it's not as necessary to prove that anymore. Um, what we'll do is we'll do some restoration test plots where we'll actually do some clearing and some burning in an area just to see how the vegetation responds. And what we found is um, rest doing these transects will reveal the status of the native seed bank and provide information regarding potential of the site and in some of our test plots we found that by just clearing away like the buckthorn that was growing in there and scraping away the reed canary grass that we had more than 150 species just emerging from the seed bank just once it was cleared away and that's with no seeding at all just getting the invasive species out of the way. So here's a site that we've actually developed into a an ENRV type wetland mitigation bank and it's in the city of Lionel Lakes which is in the Anoka Samplain and this is an area that's owned by the city. It's a city park and when we started the project it contained three state listed rare vascular plant species which are shown in these little triangles were scattered throughout the park. It was it had remnant areas of very high quality that were still ecologically intact it was under threat by invasive species and a lack of management and also just the loss of disturbance. There was no fire anymore running through those areas. And we knew that it had the potential uh, to support rare species with management and the city had proposed it um, in their city plan that they would like to restore that area. So it was a high priority for the city and they had also proposed it as a nature preserve so it would have added public value if restored. Another site that we looked at to qualify for creation of a bank was what we call Site 7 and it's located in the city of Blaine and it's this area in pink at the top of that area and it's 180 acres in size so it's much larger than that 16 acre site in Woolens or in, in Lionel Lakes and it had a unique habitat containing a poor fen, a rich fen and a wet meadow area. It contained uh, lance leaf violet, a Minnesota threatened species, twisted yellow-eyed grass, an endangered species, and habitat for additional rare species should we restore the area. It had remnant areas still intact. It was under threat by development, invasive species, lack of management, natural dis and lack of natural disturbance, and had the potential to support other rare species with management. And it was proposed as a large city nature center. So, this whole area outlined in yellow, all owned by the city. In total, it was 500 acres. So we had this 180-acre site at the north, and then in total, it would be part of a 500-acre city park. So it was a good site. So once we've found a site, so we found these two sites, and we have other sites as well, we were able to collect much more detailed and specific information, which we can use to roll into an ENRV bank application. So what we do is we go out and define and map the existing plant communities. So this is an example of us doing that here at Site 7. Um, we document any known locations of unique or rare species. We identify all the restoration needs. Um, we and then we go out and establish these 10 meter by 10 meter vegetation plots. So within this 80, 180 acre site we have 16 10 meter by 10 meter vegetation plots that we can go back to and revisit and see how vegetation responds to our restoration activities over time. And within each of these plots, we calculate what is called a baseline floristic quality index value. 
and we use that as to set our performance standards for these banks and, and I'll show you a little bit more about what that means. And Floristic Quality Index has been the accepted method for tracking improvements to vegetation over time within these types of ENRV banks. So to calculate the FQI score, we go out to each of those 10 by 10 meter plots and we collect a lot of detailed vegetation information. So I just showed a picture of our data sheet here that you can see just at the start of the project, it's, the species list isn't too long because there are a lot of invasives and, and issues that need to be addressed, but it's still very detailed looking at everything from the canopy all the way down to the smallest of things deep down in the grass. So we have to dig around and, and get, get a very thorough species list. And these are kind of pre-restoration how things look. So you're out in tall phragmites and you're tripping through reed canary grass. Like it's not the easiest stuff to go out and collect. And I put in a couple of other pictures too. This is one of our sites, uh, the Jason out there with his machetes. So you wouldn't want to meet him alone in the dark, but when he's doing, but he always has that, you know, and it works. And then here's a picture of our, our friend John just wiping out just trying to get to these sites. So before restoration, it takes some effort to get out there. So with that information, we calculate the Floristic Quality Index score. And I don't know that I need to go into great detail about this, but it's a really powerful metric that we use. And it, it takes into account species richness of a vegetation plot, the conservatism of all the species that are in a plot, and also the abundance of those species in plots. And then you can also use this number to track how things change over time. So the equation, I have it down there, is you're taking the C value times, the C value is the coefficient of conservatism, and um, so how conservative a species is, times the square root of species richness, and you get a floristic quality index score. So down here, are ranges of FQI scores. So if we know if we, have a, if we get a score for a plot of 20, then we're looking at about a medium quality vegetation. And if we're able to bump that up higher to 24 or 25, we're getting into high quality range. So we have a range that we're working with trying to bump the quality of vegetation up. So here's an example of how this looks on our, we have our 16 plots out there and we've calculated a floristic quality index score for each of them. And this is our baseline information. So we have a starting point to work with when we go into the application <coughs> phase. So once we've collected all this information and we believe that we can qualify a site for the ENRV provisions, we start the three-part application process. And just briefly, it's, there's the draft prospectus, the prospectus, and then the full banking application. And I have a couple of these with me. You can, they just start getting thicker and thicker as you go through the process. And you're just providing more and more detailed information and the agencies are reviewing at each level, providing feedback, and you're changing things to meet their requirements. But basically what you get out of this, I have a shorter list, is at the end of this application process, you know the size and boundaries of your proposed bank. You know what actions eligible for credit you can use to create wetland credits. And in our case, it's going to be just the ENRV vegetation restoration. You have a five-year restoration plan and approach that's detailed. You have a five-year monitoring plan that you're going to follow. And you have your vegetation performance standards set out. And also a credit release schedule, a long-term management plan. You say who's going to own it at the end and who's going to fund the long-term management over time. So for, one, like for instance, for one of our sites, for, if you look at the Rich Fen area, our first goal is to bring that FQI score up in rich fen areas to an 18 and then they'll release some of our wetland mitigation credits. And then our second goal would be taking it from an 18 to a 24. So we're just trying to keep bumping that score up through restoration. And then here's just an example of a, what they call a credit release table. So we know, this is for the Site 7 area that I showed you, that we have the potential to achieve the creation of 81 
wetland mitigation credits. And as we hit each performance standard, some will get released. So we record an easement and get everything set. We get 12 credits available for sale. If we meet our first vegetation performance standard, we get up 12 more. And then you're up to 36 and 20. So they get released slowly over time as you meet your performance standards. So let's look at how we implement our project. So back to the Wollens Park site, the 17-acre project in the city of Lionel Lakes. Here's how it looked when we started. We knew that there were some great species in there, but we, it needed some work. So you can see that there's a lot of reed canary grass in there. There's a lot of standing dead trees that drowned out when water levels changed. And all that needed to be cleared out so that we could start burning and managing the site. Just another shot of that. It doesn't look so great at first glance. So what we do is we go in and clear out the dead standing trees. We, take, we mow down and rake up all the reed canary grass. So we use special equipment to really scrape the area clean so we can get down to that nice peat layer and expose the native seed bank. And we use different types of methods, like this is a street sweeper that you just blow everything out of the way. And we really get it down to the peat soil. So just mowing alone just isn't enough to expose that, that um, soil so that the seeds can germinate. So we really work to clean it up. Here's just an aerial shot of where we were doing the work. Another one. And then once things start to grow again, we can reintroduce fire to keep the area open and continue to stimulate the native seed bank and the other native species. And we do some herbiciding in areas that are really dominated by reed canary grass and other invasive species. And also just review our implementation efforts at site seven. So this is the 180 acre site and we've started implementation there as well. So this was before a lot of invasive species. Again, we had a lot of green ash, a lot of aspen that needed to be cleared, a lot of reed canary grass. And then some areas that were fairly nice, like I said, these areas have some nice remnants that we work around, still lacking in diversity and needing management, but overall doing pretty well. And so this is a site of us starting to clear so we're taking down a lot of green ash trees and we're doing a lot of raking and cleaning up. You can see our piles of reed canary grass debris just piling up all over the site. So this is a larger scale project. And we found as we cut down the green ash trees that they were only about 50 years old. So they had come in fairly recently and really just shaded out the native understory. And with clearing, we knew we could bring native species back. Just another sight of it, just getting all cleared out and ready to be burned. Here's Jason standing out there. This is some Phragmites that are being mowed down. And then this is the nice uh, rich, or poor fen peat center that we tried to, we wanted to make sure that we didn't um, impact it negatively when we were doing our efforts. So we were sure to mark those area and areas. And here's an area where the rare plants were found, just a small pocket when we started. And again, just some real strategic herbicide application. So where it's nice, we avoided, but we worked around those areas to kill off the invasive species. Again, just very strategic. And then following each year of implementation, you're required to generate an annual monitoring report. And this just shows what you did that year, and then you can make a request to release um, wetland credits. And again, we go out and collect vegetation data. We monitor the coverage of invasive species in each of the plant communities. And this all gets reported in an annual report that includes, like I said, the implementation tasks, summary of the vegetation observations, hydrology observations, any easement infractions, and representative photographs. And then we also make a request 
for a release of credits if we're meeting our performance standards. So what's it looking like at Wollens Park after, so we've been implementing since 2014, and what we found is an increasing average in that floristic quality index score every year. It's going up and up and up. And we started with, well, we're up to 117 vascular plant species within our, what we have four monitoring plots out there. And that's up from 60 when we started the project in 2014. We've gone from three state listed species to five, and we've shown re reduction in cover of the non-native species. And the city has already um, secured 5.7 acres of wetland credits for sale or use by, their, by themselves. So that's a value of at least $375,000 through restoration efforts. And just looking at a couple of charts, this is the total species richness at Wollens Park. So this is our, our plots, one, two, three, four and then a total count of species over on the other axis. And you can see that basically every year, the number of species in each plot just continues to increase with restoration efforts. And we see a little decrease in plot three um, in 2017, that's in purple here, and that's just due to some of the restoration that we continue to do. So we do have to go in and keep scraping and clearing the vegetation, so sometimes it will drop down for a year, but then it will recover in the following years. And then just looking at the floristic quality index score, you can see again, most the mean overall has gone from 17.5 in 2014 up to 27.94 in 2017. So things have really improved as far as species diversity at Wollens Park. And then again, looking at rare species populations. When we started, we had the three rare species and they were just scattered throughout the site. And by 2017, we were up to five rare species and they had, we just, we didn't use points anymore. We needed to draw polygons because they just continued to expand and proliferate with restoration efforts. And it's looking like this is kind of how it looks out there as restoration is progressing. So you'll still have reed canary grass um, growing throughout the site, but you'll start getting these veins of nice uh, native plant community coming in and that will just continue to expand with your restoration efforts. So this is how it looks kind of midway through and then just continues to improve. So we get nice sweeping areas of um, blue joint, wiregrass, bog wiregrass sedge, the three-way sedge, iris, arrowhead, and this again, like I said, no seeding, just stimulating the native seed bank. And some of the rare species that have come are at Wollens Park, like I said, twisted yellow-eyed grass. We have the Rotal ramosaur and the Juncus pelicarpus, which wasn't, haven't really been seen in the area since the 1920s, and that re-emerged from the seed bank. So some really unique things are coming up with restoration. And we have the autumn fimbri, the purple false foxglove, and just really sweeping areas of lanceleaf violets. So it's getting to be fairly common out there. And then results at site seven are similar. This is only after one year of restoration. So it took a couple of years to get the project approved, but once we got going, we we're seeing again, just in one year, that average FQI score has increased from 13.8 to 18.41. And we have 128 vascular plant species recorded in our 16 monitoring plots, up from 97 in, in 2014. But like I said, just one year of restoration. Um, two, two state listed species, lanceleaf violet and twisted yellow eyed grass. And we've seen obviously a reduction in non native species and increasing dominance of these sedge meadow areas. So you can see in the photo on the left just how. What was once just carpets of reed canary grass and invasives is now looking much nicer, like a nice sedge meadow just continuing to expand out. And let's see, we already have established, we can actually ask for a release of about 12 acres of credit already to be used or sold by the city. And because they're in the process of developing uh, their own uh, wetland nature center or their own nature center featuring these wetland areas, they will have some wetland impacts associated with that. 
as well as some other city projects, so they'll likely use a lot of their own credits that they've generated. And then just looking at the scores overall, you can just see how in each of our plots, the FQI scores just are bouncing up little by little. So we also use this information to target where we should do restoration next year. So if we see areas that are lagging, we know we really need to focus our efforts in those areas. So these numbers actually give us a lot of information. But throughout the site, we're just seeing improvements just after one year of restoration. And again, just a photo of how things are looking, which is quite a bit different than the before uh, photos. And then looking at um, total species richness per plot. So like I said, this site is much larger and we have 16 plots, but in each instance at each plot, the species richness has just improved in each plot substantially after just one year. And again, um, Oh, and this is just, sorry, native species. So this is total species richness, which includes invasives and natives. And then this is just native species. So it's really the, the native species that are just really um, increasing each year. And then again, the floristic quality index score just continues to increase in each of the plots. And then this is just a photo of what the city has planned for the site. So here's the area that we're restoring up in the north. And this is going to be a proposed nature center over here. And they're planning a substantial trail system through this whole 500 acre site. And it's really about engaging the public with this unique wetland area and really teaching them a lot about what's happening right here in their communities. So it's actually a really unique opportunity. And just in summary, like I said, our company has worked on six of these ENRV type banks. Four of them are active, which is about 360 acres of permanently protected high quality habitat. We have two proposed, which will be another 195 acres should they be approved. Um, we're looking at generating hundreds of credits for use by the owners of these banks, or they can be sold on the open market. We're meeting the intent of the Wetland Conservation Act to achieve that no net loss of quantity and quality, or quantity quality, but we're really looking at biological diversity and quality. So we're working towards that. Um, we've documented major increases in biodiversity in these areas, re reduced invasive species cover. We know we've protected thousands of individuals of rare plant species. And we also have long-term management plans in place for these areas, and they have a funding mechanism, so they will be cared for in the long term. And we have educational opportunities occurring. We have tons of information in these relevé data uh, collection points, or our sampling points at each of these sites. We have years of vegetation information that could be used for um, the study of restoration of these sites in the future. And new open space opportunities. One of our sites did end up being dedicated as a DNR scientific and natural area site, that highest level of protection of high quality area in the state. One of them was um, actually became an SNA, which is very exciting. And we believe this is a very uh, viable method for generating wetland credits in Minnesota. So we just have a special thank you to all the folks that we've worked with on these projects, the bank owners and our, cons our other contractors that have done a lot of the restoration work. And I think that is all. And I just want to note that we do have a, we, every year we teach an annual sedge identification workshop. So if anyone's interested in coming, I do have some flyers and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But take you out to that SNA. Yes, and you can see <laughs> all the sites. But thank you. <laughs> sold in that database and they are no longer available for sale. So they can only be sold one time. And then how do they ensure management of these after they're dedicated? Yeah, they do have specialized staff and they do go out and check these areas. They don't get checked every year after that five year initial monitoring period is over. 
But after that, they do go back and spot check over time, and you are required to keep them, keep them going, as you said you would. Mm -hmm. I have a couple other questions while I wait. Okay. I'm just got a question on what kind of herbicides used for control of reef carrying grass. Yeah. Could, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, he was wondering about what types of herbicide we use on reed canary grass. And typically we just use a water-approved herbicide, mostly like the rodeo type. And it seems to be fairly effective. I know, have they tried some other? Use mm -hmm. post. Do you want to use my? <laughs> they also well, use post. Do you, you use that like your upland site? I don't think you can use that in wetland site. Uh, yeah, that would be upland. Mm -hmm. What, what percentage of, uh, like, the rodeo? It's under 2% active solution. Mm -hmm. But so it's, it's always a following label direction or label instructions, but it's usually under 2% active solution. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of for Jason. Um, <laughs> So when did you first realize that there was sort of a business? Talk to us a little bit about the, the business and becoming a, uh, here, no, you can have this one. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, a business. Well, I started my business in uh, 1999, and that was after working for a consulting firm for a year and a half, um, documenting the destruction of the natural world. Uh, <laughs> And then, um, and then working for Great River Greening, which is a really great nonprofit in uh, St. Paul, when they expanded from gre uh, greening the Great River Park, a very small project, to Great River Greening, a very large kind of geographic project throughout the Twin Cities. And I was their restoration ecologist just for a couple of years, and I realized I wanted to work on the Anoka sand plain, and they weren't working on the Anoka sand plain. I wanted to work with these wetlands. And so I started my business to really kind of document where these types of wetlands really were, and where the you know the flora that they support where they were, and then um, to try to determine uh, methods uh, to do just what you said to generate financial incentives to for the restoration and protection of these really unique systems, and so. Um, I don't know when the light bulb went off, but it, it went off sometime during when I got I was the one who documented the site uh, for the Blaine Preserve SNA, that let one of those last slides that Amy showed. Now that was in 1999, I documented that site and it was right up against the highway um, at 35 at one of the last interchanges right up by where Medtronic is now, like a highly valuable real estate that was never going to get developed because of the rare features there and um, and just the, the all of the challenges. And so I documented that in 1999 and by 2004 I got a call and said we need your help to ha figure out how to make this site, how to protect the resources of part of the site while facilitating and allowing the development of the degraded portions of the site. And that's when we, we found the ENRV uh, provision of WACA and um, and really just cracked the book open and figured out how are we going to apply this to the site and we made it work and um, then after that the it there was I, I knew of a dozen other sites that we're still working on today that we were one by one trying to get protected and restored but I've done a lot of work with um, she scratched the surface, pun intended, on the restoration <laughs> plots out there where we, we were out in the wintertime, winter scarifying and mowing and exposing peat soils to just show what the potential is out in these systems. Sometimes I get paid to do that and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I get permission to do that and sometimes I don't. I ask forgiveness <laughs> after the fact. Um, and so, yeah, it's really just being pretty tenacious about it and driven and just knowing that eventually with really uh, good science, good data, and of course the, this justification, I mean the protection of rare natural resources that this is all, you know, people are going to find a way to want to protect these things and incentivize it. Yeah? I, I, who are your uh, major clients? That's one question. And then secondly, I was just kind of wondering, what is the demand for the product of the credits? I mean, yeah. How much of a yeah. market demand is that? Yeah, so 
So my clients are everything from private developers. Um, they come kind of kicking and screaming uh, to uh, watershed districts or cities, which are um, sometimes kicking and screaming, but most many times are um, more proactive. They understand the value in this and are incorporating this in their even in their um, um, community like development, wetland restoration and wetland crediting in their community development plans. And so um, what's, what Amy really couldn't possibly uh, go into detail about is that most of these sites are within the Rice Creek Watershed District. And the Rice Creek Watershed District has their own rules on top of WACA that say any wetland impact that occurs within the Rice Creek Watershed District has to be mitigated for within the Rice Creek Watershed District. And so when you talk about demand, that means that these banks within the Rice Creek Watershed Districts are the only banks that can be, only credits that can be sold to people impacting in the Rice Creek Watershed District. So the demand then goes even higher because there might be other banks in Hennepin County and in Minneapolis or outstate Minnesota that, that other people can use. But if you're impacting in Rice Creek Watershed District, you have to mitigate. So you're either gonna do on site or you're gonna buy from a bank. And so what we're finding with the demand for credits, I mean, that's a long answer. The short answer is that they, the credits are selling almost as fast as we can, we can um, generate them. And they're selling for upwards you know, of $2, $2.25 a square foot, so like $100,000 a, a, a credit or an acre. Do you operate in other uh, less progressive states? Um, we, we, we operate, we're starting to operate in outstate Minnesota, and we are, because um, Amy's from Iowa, we're, we're starting to look at opportunities for similar um, projects in Iowa, in north, northeast Iowa and things like that. But, but the, the one thing about Iowa is they don't have a Wetland Conservation Act, so there's really no mandate for replacement. You've got your core rules, the new wetland delineation or destructions yeah. and such. So. <clears throat> to a large extent, the same rules exist. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so instead, but rather than dealing with state agency, you're dealing with the federal side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so we are, all of these credits that we're developing for the ENRV under WACA are also being developed as um, vegetation enhancement credits under under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act for the core. And so we need core, we get core approval for all these Minnesota projects. and. Quite frankly, the credits, if we just develop WACA approved credits and that aren't core approved, they are, I wouldn't say useless, but they don't sell for $2 a square foot. They, some, you know, they sell for a lot less and the demand for non-core approved credits are a lot less because most of the projects that are being, uh, that are impacting wetlands in Minnesota are, are also impacting core uh, regulated waters of the U.S. You know, wetlands. That's at Wollens. So. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Wollens Park um, is the smaller 17 acre site at Lionel Lakes and what they wanted to do with that site, because that's part of a larger wetland system, I don't want to, I don't want to get off on a tangent too much, but they wanted to restore the north end of that system because they want the developer or the private landowners to restore the, the rest of it and make a bank and they said we're going to put our money where our mouth is and we're going to do a demonstration project and generate credits that we need but we're also going to do it mostly with city resources so we've been the general and they've been the troops and they and they've used most of their city staff to do a lot of that work I've done some of it um, but I'd say our consulting fees on that have been maybe like seventy thousand dollars and and then the rest of the work's been done with city um, public work staff and city equipment, and so probably somewhere around $100,000, and they've generated $375,000 in work, you know, value of credit. And now, the thing is, is that's potentially going to double by the end of this project if we can meet this relatively high performance standard. We have to get the reed canary down to under 5% cover, and we're right about 10% right now from like 90%. Um, so. Um, when we get below 5%, they get a, another 25% credit and that essentially would double the value of that bank. And um, so they're probably looking at, you know, around half a million dollars on a 16 acre, 17 acre site. That's pretty good. 
The city of Blaine, this larger site seven bank, that's a 180, 190 acre site. And they're already looking at uh, their first credit release this year is gonna be, you had it up there about 600, $700,000. The total project budget for five years for that is about eight or $900,000. So at some point they're gonna be breaking even in the second year and then every credit after that they make is, is worth $100,000 and they're up to 80 credits. So they're gonna be, they're looking at a, generating potentially $4 million in revenue above and beyond their costs um, to help long-term restoration and maintenance and then also um, um, establishment of the Nature Center, which is a multi-million dollar project. I will say, and Amy didn't mention this because of time, there was a bank just south of Site 7 that we've completed, which was the initial bank, and that was a Branch 3 bank, and it was generated 55 acres of credit, which they, that was the potential and they generated it all. And, and so that was about $5 million worth of credit. And that cost, that project cost about $700,000. And they've sold more than half of those credits already. They've used them or sold them for development projects. So, you yeah. know. Now, once they generate, are they gonna have to maintain those? That's yeah, yes. So they're gonna, they're gonna have some Recurring costs, not shouldn't be shouldn't be a yes. lot, but there's so the, some recurring yes. costs. So the design of uh, the way we design these restorations is there they were established over thousands of years as fire dependent peatland systems, and they've been fire suppressed and maybe perhaps monkeyed with hydrologically. So we're restoring hydrology where appropriate, but usually not, and then we're reestablishing a native fire regime. And so when we hand these over to the uh, sit to the client after five years, maybe it's seven years, you know, might take a little longer. From seven years on, every three to five years, the main management regime is a prescribed burn. And, and that's what we're finding. These sites are so well, you know, re repaired and reestablished that, and they have the fuel to carry the fire, and they, they lack the invasive species, is that that's what's gonna mostly maintain them. And so, the, the inputs in the first year are hundreds of thousands, you know, half a million dollars. The second year, hundreds of thousands of dollars. By the fifth year, you know, less than $100,000. And then as you taper off into, you know, 10 years and 20 years and beyond, you're talking, you know, management every few, three, five years, and, and then certainly some monitoring and some herbiciding and things like that. But that's the plan.